example, we appreciate uh, very much the cooperation of uh, our colleagues at uh, different think tanks uh, and universities, uh, for example, the Center for National Security Law of the University of Virginia Law School um, and the Potomac and some of the others. So uh, it's actually, as you said, Don, it is a follow-up. And um, the purpose of this uh, event, as uh, all of you probably know, is uh, related to the uh, energy um, challenges in regards to the uh, COVID-19, um, both uh, in the U.S. and, of course, uh, in internationally. So um, we are delighted to uh, welcome uh, all the panelists. What I will do, I will introduce them in the order of our program. And I, I, I do hope that you have the program and um, we'll try to follow that. Now, uh, we're very honored to have the keynote speaker, General Retired Wesley Clark. Uh, as uh, you know, if uh, you look at the bio, um, it is uh, interesting that uh, people identify him uh, in uh, the military and his uh, many accomplishments there, but uh, truly uh, is a man of all seasons, as uh, many of you know, in terms of his uh, interdisciplinary uh, contributions, um, not only the military and politics, but uh, also business education, uh, public outreach. Actually, uh, it needs no uh, uh, introduction, but I uh, just would mention one or two of his uh, many notable uh, accomplishments. Um, in, in politics, as many of us uh, know, he was a presidential uh, candidate um, in politics. And then, of course, um, in uh, the military, um, is a four-star uh, general uh, who contributed a great deal, uh, not only during times of uh, war, but space as well, uh, also combating in the uh, of Vietnam and Kosovo and so forth. But um, I, I think in terms of his uh, military accomplishment, I, I want to, to mention particularly um, his role as commander of the US European Command, Supreme Allied Commander uh, in Europe. And um, academically, uh, obviously, many of us um, know that he graduated first of his uh, class at West Point and uh, completed uh, degrees interdisciplinary, I may say, in philosophy, politics, and economics at uh, Oxford University in terms of uh, education. And uh, additionally, I, I think in the business, particularly the business uh, area, I would like to, to mention um, his role, uh, for example, in the energy security partners and uh, his work and interest in uh, energy, including uh, oil and um, electric power and so forth. So uh, in, in one word, I, I think if we may uh, <clears throat> mention that is considered but um, many of the people know of his accomplishment as a great American. Uh, General Clark, please. So, Jonah, thank you very, Jonah, thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me in that kind introduction. And uh, ambassadors uh, and ladies and gentlemen, it's a real honor to be with you. I'm really privileged to, uh, to be able to participate in this discussion. Um, I, um, I was teaching at West Point in the early 1970s. I was teaching economics and political philosophy and national security after I came back from Vietnam. And in 1972, we read with interest the Club of Rome report 
that suggested that by the turn of the century, we'd be nearly out of hydrocarbons and other minerals. And uh, we didn't believe it at the time. It seemed alarmist, but, uh, and yet as, uh, as the century turned, as China uh, joined the World Trade Organization, as it began to import oil, uh, and as conventional oil companies were struggling to find the new super giant fields that had dominated oil production in the past, well, it looked like we were leaving the age of petroleum. Even British Petroleum adopted as its motto, beyond petroleum. I was in Arkansas and um, people came through and they began to tell me that there was something called fracking and people were buying up uh, mineral rights. And so I began to look at this, but actually most of the United States was interested in moving beyond petroleum, it seemed. Uh, we created the renewable fuel standards as legislation in Congress, which mandated by law an increasing amount of biofuel uh, to be mixed with gasoline and diesel. Um, and companies were investing left and right in biofuels, including oil companies. Now, some people said they were cynical. They were going to invest and put the technology on the shelf just to make sure there wasn't competition. But I think it was genuine investment. Oil prices were rising. We've gone from $12 a barrel in 1988, 1998, uh, up to 30 and 40 and $55 a barrel. I was at Goldman Sachs at the time, and I remember they told me, it'll never go above $50 a barrel. And then suddenly it was $75 a barrel. $100 oil was in sight, and we briefly touched it along with $13 natural gas in 2007, 2008. Fracking was just getting started. Then we had a recession and a recovery. And just before COVID hit, we were the world's largest producer of oil. On the renewable side, in the electricity, the power markets, and I think we have to talk about that as well. Um, the renewable sector fought heavy headwinds. The big utilities did not like wind and solar. There were a number of reasons for it and many objections. And um, I tried to put up a wind turbine in Arkansas and I was told I was going against the state legislature. I asked, what is that? They said, oh, don't you know the legislature's owned by Entergy and they like Powder River cold, cold. So, but renewables has proven increasingly resilient. We've broken the cycle of needing more power uh, in proportion to the growth in GDP just didn't happen. We actually are pretty uh, efficient. We're growing GDP without growing electricity consumption. Uh, but at the same time, we have to acknowledge that there are threats and there are growing threats to the U.S. electricity grid from cyber and EMP, and, um, and they require substantial investments. All this has been brought into sharp focus by the pandemic with COVID. And it's not only about the global economy and energy, it's also about geo strategy. So let me see if I can quickly sketch out some of the relationships and then you know, look forward to the discussion. On the energy front, in the last three months, oil demand dropped from some 100 million barrels a day to a little over 80. And this occurred just as the OPEC plus agreements failed to be renewed between Saudi Arabia and Russia. Prices crashed. It's taken painful dialogue and several weeks to partially recover. We're up to $40 oil um, about right now from where it was at 55. Oil demand has gone up, back up. It's around 90 million barrels a day, but it's not predicted to return to 100 until well into 2022. The ultimate peak, if current trends continue and nobody does anything extraordinary, might be up to 120 million barrels a day in the late 2020, early 2030 period. But as the crisis hit, U.S. energy production was already in trouble. So-called tight oil obtained by fracking declines far more rapidly than conventional wells. So put in a fracked well, it'll go down 60, 70 percent in the first year in production. May start at 500 barrels a day, maybe even 1,000 barrels per day 
in a, in a Permian. But at the end of the year, you're down at 70%. Conventional oil may be a 4% decline as you lose reservoir pressure. The expansion of U.S. oil production came by fracking, but the fracking was not an idea of producing oil endlessly. It was an expansion in reserves, and it was fueled by debt. Recently, the banks and their investors have soured on the prospects of fracking because they realize there's so much oil now available in source rocks that you could poison the whole planet with it forever. And the reserves, therefore, have much less value than previously believed. So there's major uncertainty in U.S. oil production. And the fact that U.S. oil production is down some 2 million barrels a day from its peak a few months ago, about a quarter of the U.S. recovery since 2010 has been driven by fracking. And since the industry is under threat and shaking, this merely adds to the economic anxieties of COVID. On the renewable side, of course, we've been using tax advantages for a long time, the production tax credit, the investment um, you know, uh, energy uh, tax credit for solar have been critical to the expansion, but the technology's improved. And still, uh, it takes long-term money and the need for tax advantages to drive these investments. Now, you would think with declining interest rates, that's a good thing, but actually, what we find in the investment community, and I'm an investment banker myself now, 20 years out of the military, is that a lot of money sits on the sidelines looking for distressed assets, as we say. So I think we can expect the continued rapid expansion of renewables to take a pause absent other activities. So what does it mean geostrategically for US security and um, for terrorism? Well. Geostrategically, Russia is pursuing hydrocarbons. You know, 15 years ago, Putin believed the future was nuclear, but now he believes it's still hydrocarbons. His plan has been to seize control of Syria's oil, then have the European banks finance rebuilding that oil infrastructure under his control, buy into Israel's offshore oil, win over Egyptian President Sisi, and simultaneously take Libya's oil. Putin even summoned Nigerian President Buhari to him and told him, you need to work with us now. And he's got this Wagner group, a Wagner group and other Russian mercenaries enlarging their presence throughout Africa. So he's able to use military power, deniably. Coupled with the North Sea pipeline that's coming in, Russia would have the ability to dominate Europe's energy sources under Putin's plan and much strength in its hand. Now, it hasn't quite worked out as easily, but, but things, these things never do. MBS thought that he could destroy Russia's markets by overproduction, underselling, taking the markets, collapsing the price of oil. Powerful move in late February, but interrupted by COVID. So uh, that hasn't quite worked out. Russia, of course, has its own COVID problems, plus it's having problems with Bashar Assad, taking control of Syria, dealing with Turkey, and General Hiftar hasn't been all he was cracked up to be. Nor have the Euros agreed, at least not yet, to finance rebuilding Syria's oil infrastructure. But this is geostrategy unfolding. It moves in fits and starts, but you have to see the major movements. Europe, of course, talked for years about powerful undersea cables connecting to Libya's desert and all its solar potential, and that would supplement North Sea wind, and Europe would be all renewable. That hasn't happened at all. China, meanwhile, is on the outlier in this, taking advantage of low prices to build its reserves, waiting in the wings to exploit Iran and Africa, seeking to undercut through investments both Russian and U.S. influence in Europe. But China is strengthening its internal controls, attempting to position itself in the crisis of COVID as a global leader, and it is increasingly assertive militarily. President Xi is a powerful leader, a lifetime leader, but also insecure. He's got some of his own, some of his own challenges internally. So where are we headed? In terms of oil, moving toward $50.
It's enough to hold down U.S. fracking and delay major upstream investments. Both Saudi Arabia and Russia would like to see oil in the 80 range, and that could happen uh, if they are successful. Meanwhile, at home, the luster continues to fade for fracking. If economic growth resumes in the world, that puts upper pressure on demand, but it doesn't solve the U.S. banking issues. In terms of renewables and the grid, uh, we need about $2 trillion to fix the grid. And we need to invest maybe a comparable amount to really make it uh, amenable to renewable energy. But this all depends on how we come out of this crisis, what we do. It's all about U.S. leadership. Will we hang on in NATO, strengthen our European connections, work to deepen engagement in Africa? Can we avoid stumbling into a conflict with China over Taiwan and the South China Sea? And all that geo strategy is continuing, even as we worry about COVID. Truth is, um, and I've, um, you know, I've been connected with several of the pharmaceutical companies and worked at this sector pretty closely, as many of you have. No country is safe from recurrence. We've got to anticipate not just a prolonged first wave, but a global second wave so that by December, a new administration coming in could, it could look like 1932 in terms of fear and economic crisis. China and Russia cannot lead the world through this. So if you believe that no crisis should be wasted, as they always say in politics, in this case, the COVID crisis with falling energy prices, confusion in OPEC and OPEC plus, and low interest rates, the United States has a key leadership opportunity here to lead in energy and through energy in addressing climate change. And the mounting threat of climate change makes that leadership ever more necessary. So I'm sure I don't have to lay out the fundamental security threat of climate change, government dysfunction, impoverishment, disease, terrorism, et cetera. But it won't be fixed or even addressed without leadership from the United States. We know Kyoto, 1997, fail. Paris, 19, uh, Paris, uh, 2015, 2018, 17, failed. Barack Obama's leadership, um, I was at the Copenhagen crisis in 2009, uh, wasn't enough to get us through Trump. And Paris, 2015, failed. And even governments, as enlightened as Australia and Canada, have largely moved away from the goals they previously accepted. <clears throat> this month, atmospheric carbon at Mauna Loa was at 417 parts per million. Of course, that's the highest ever. In fact, according to scientific research that we've got, it's the highest in 23 million years. There's never been a Greenland ice cap when carbon has been above 400 parts per million. So there's just a question of how soon it all comes down. There's no way to halt at 450. We're going up at two and a half parts per million per year. And the adverse impacts are already obvious in the Mideast and the Sahel. So we need leadership. Now we've got the technology. We've got the renewables. We've got everything we need, but the leadership and the incentives to apply that technology. So how do we do it? We need a carbon tax plus an international carbon tax on exports of hydrocarbons. That international tax could be paid into a global fund to assist developing countries to promote green economic development. And at the same time, we should use low interest rates at home to fund a transformation of the U.S. electricity grid. We need to segment that grid. We need stronger protection on cybersecurity. We need microgrids. We need to make it uh, fully compatible with renewable. What are the specifics of the tax? Well, it needs to escalate over time. It needs to augment government resources as well as being given back to those at the lower income levels who are uh, most impacted by such a tax. We need to review it periodically. And we need to show uh, through our actions at home the leadership abroad. 
That's the way to deal with China. It's the way to keep the EU on our side. And it's the way to deal with the crises we face. As far as COVID is concerned, there's much to be said. But government goes on. And um, energy is a fundamental part of that challenge. With that, Yona, I'd like to stop and uh, turn it back to you and be delighted to hear the discussion. The overview on the the geo politics and strategy and so on. Uh, do you do you have time for a couple of questions? Uh, um, perhaps um, our colleague Don Wallace uh, would like to ask a question. I I have a question myself. Maybe some of our panelists. I'm not sure. I'd like to ask a question. I think General Clark has pretty much covered everything authoritatively. Um, let me, do the, let me ask you then about the tax. Actually, my cousin uh, won a Nobel Prize, Bill Nordhaus, and his specialty was, in fact... Oh, yeah, sure. Great guy. Now, this is his field. I guess my question is this. Do you think among... I don't want to say... Uh, on the left and the right, among thinking people in public life, is there a relative consensus as to the carbon tax, how it would work? Let's say with a new administration or otherwise. Do you think it's something that will happen in the U.S.? You know, you can't move forward in addressing climate change without putting a price on carbon. I think that's pretty well accepted academically now. You, you can't pick technologies. No one would have said in 2008 that the wind turbines could be improved if you could raise the height of the tower from 80 meters to 100 and the length of the blades accordingly. No one would have predicted in that time that you would, uh, you couldn't have gone to a company and say, give me a 10 megawatt offshore wind turbine. How much will that cost? If you tried to buy it the way you buy rockets from Boeing, you'd fail. The only way to do it is let the market sort through this. And the way you do that is with a carbon tax. Now you can provide other incentives. You can provide tax incentives for R&D and other things. But Without a carbon tax, you can't balance off the various prospective routes and the investments across the economy. The real challenge is, A, it's called a tax. So you've got to have a crisis to get into a tax. By December, we could be looking not at $7 trillion of Fed debt. We could be looking at 11, 12, 14 trillion of Fed debt. We just don't know where this is going to go. And so there'll be a crying uh, need at some point, especially if Democrats are elected, to balance the budget. And the only way to do that is with tax increases. Now, you can get a certain amount of that from high-income people. You can get a certain amount of that back from corporations. And, and um, the Biden campaign, you said they're going to raise corporate tax rates. I think it was back to 28% or something like this. But, but what you really have to do is you have to shape the economy. We shaped it in the years after World War II for home ownership. We need to shape it for uh, zero carbon. And that has to be done with some kind of a tax incentive. Thank you. OK, can I uh, just ask one quick uh, question? General, you mentioned uh, the electricity uh, perspective. Can I ask you uh, about uh, one of the major security challenges uh, which relates to uh, utilization of water and um, that particular perspective, in other words, to generate uh, electric power and um, the, the struggle over the control of uh, waters and rivers uh, related to the energy issue? Sure, um, but, but here's the thing. Reverse osmosis is just one of the technologies and it's been popularized by cheap energy in the Middle East. Um, but it's also very uh, harmful um, through the, to environmentally when you put um, a 60%, 70% brine solution back in. So um, I think as you look at where we are, first of all, uh, the, the atmosphere is carrying a lot more water. The problem is it's not in the right places. 
So there are a variety, like everything else, there's a variety of ways of addressing this. Uh, there's still opportunity for uh, reservoir construction in areas that have um, higher water. You can take water out of the atmosphere with wind and solar just through refrigeration. There's a Dutch company that has this technology. Uh, we tried to promote it in the Middle East, but it's um, a function of how badly do you want the water. There are also new technologies for desalination, including some that use electric energy. Um, I know the Russians have a, have a technology like this. I was shown this in Paris several years ago. I was told it was going to pile up production. I don't know whatever happened to it, but it was a two thirds more efficient and it did not produce the brine um, after it just uh, produced a dry salt that could be harvested. So um, this is an area that can be worked and will be. We just have to continue uh, on path to uh, use the technology we have and we have to have a means internationally for distributing that technology in an economic fashion. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any people from the pan panelists or, or commentator who would like to ask uh, the general question? Well, um, if, if not, I, I really would like to ask you um, a question more on the humanitarian uh, level. Uh, in, in the face of uh, ethnic, racial, and religious um, intolerance and violence that we see around the world, I, I recall your leadership when you were the Supreme Allies Commander of Europe and uh, NATO in the uh, operation in Kosovo, that actually uh, your contribution, I think, uh, was uh, very significance in terms of saving um, about a million and a half, I think, uh, Albanians from uh, ethnic uh, cleansing. Can you uh, please may make uh, one of the your remarks uh, related to that uh, particular challenge that we're facing? And um, we see it even in uh, the, the shadow of the pandemic now, um, in, in terms of racism, for example, and so forth. So, um, it's a, you've asked me a really uh, broad uh, question, but a very important one. Um, I think we moved after Kosovo, we, we adopted or we tried to move towards something called a responsibility to protect, to deal with humanitarian um, assistance and even authorized humanitarian interventions, but um, that's gone. There's no RTP out there, in part because uh, we have major geostrategic competitors in Russia and China, but also in part because we in the United States didn't take advantage of the power we had when we had it. The Libyan intervention in 2011 was a failure because there was no um, follow-up and there was no way to reestablish a government that had support and leadership on the ground. We simply created, through air power, a failed state. And um, if you look at the world today, of course, our president doesn't, is trying to walk back those interventions. Truth is, if you want to really help people, you have to find ways to invest, build jobs. You need a certain modicum of security um, take the case of a country like Mali today. Mali just lost 20 soldiers a couple of weeks ago in an ambush by terrorists. They've got lots of gold. They've got lots of um, oil potential uh, in the north of Mali. They can't get there. They can't provide security because they don't have any financing. They can't afford even to pay their teachers uh, a full year's salary in Mali. So it starts with government resourcing, it starts with good governance, and then expanding out with security, and then providing means for investment. And um, if you could do a responsibility to protect on top of that, that's fine. But, uh, but Yona, I've been increasingly concerned that the United States relies way too much on military power 
doesn't understand the economic and investment instruments of power and has fundamentally misunderstood the origins of much of the terrorist recruiting. One of the real problems we face in the 21st century is what gives meaning to people's lives. I mean, people our age, we had a different, we came up with a different mindset. For me, I was a Cold War baby and, uh, and, and saw, grew up with Khrushchev threatening the United States, the Berlin crisis, Vietnam, and to me, national security was a driving passion. Um, and it gave significance. What gives significance to a 28-year-old uh, British Muslim today? And so some lose their sight of what they're doing. Ultimately, we've got to find ways to help young people and millennials put meaning in their lives. I can't help but believe these protests are in part a function of a lot of people who were working in bars and restaurants have time on their hands and they're looking at their life and they're looking at America and they're finally realizing something's wrong and those protests are really powerful and significant. So how do we do that on a continuing basis? Mao said continuing revolutions, but that was just for Mao's purpose. How do we provide in the 21st century, when if we do this right, there's enough food, shelter, water, there's enough education, and we'll get through this pandemic. How do we provide significance for people in their lives? Thank you very much, uh, General, uh, for your contribution and for your leadership. And um, we would uh, certainly welcome your guidance in our academic work in the, in the future. Thank you again. I, I would have to, in the interest of time, I guess I would have to move on to back to our program. Unless, uh, General, you have less word. No, I'm just really honored to be with you. And may I uh, still listen in to some of this discussion and hear what you're thinking? Yeah, please. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. We would like to invite our, our colleague, Professor Rita Caldwell. Are you, are you there? Okay, I'm unmuted. Yes, I'm ready to... Oh, wonderful, Rita. I, I just, again, in the uh, interest uh, of time, um, I, I just would like to mention again that you, you are, of course, uh, known as Distinguished University Professor at the University of uh, Maryland and Johns Hopkins uh, University, the School of Public uh, Health. Um, and um, again, you really need no introduction, as we say, uh, if I may use uh, the term, women of all seasons, in terms of your many uh, contributions to our work and study. And um, I, I think we would welcome uh, your uh, remarks uh, in connection uh, with our uh, topic again on the COVID-19 issue, some uh, update. Um, the general mentioned the, the, the environment. I think this is one, one of the issues that you called our attention uh, at the latest um, ambassadors forum that we had uh, last month. At any rate, um, would, you, would you like to continue and um, just um, try to bring uh, us up with uh, some of the recent developments, particularly uh, maybe in, in relation to water and other issues. Yes, be happy to do that, Yona. Um, I do have a, just a few slides, uh, if uh, they can be shown, uh, that would be helpful. Um, are you, are you able to do that, or is uh, my assistant uh, uh, collaborating here? Um, uh, I'm sorry, Ms. Caldwell, I don't have your slides. Uh, oh, okay, okay. Well, then let me just um, um, go ahead um, and just uh, describe what I want to uh, tell you about COVID-19. Uh, uh, what what uh, it is based on is the fact that um, what we're trying to do is develop a predictive capacity that allows us to 
be able to move in when we can predict early on, four to eight weeks before epidemics occur, rather than wait until the epidemic is manifested, and by that time we've lost too many lives. Now, this is based on work that I've been doing the last uh, 40 years, actually, in developing a model for predicting cholera. I've worked in Bangladesh and um, India since 1975 and have worked out a um, model that allows us to use satellite imagery. Um, we can use uh, satellite sensors that provide an indication of um, factors like temperature and um, now and more recently uh, rainfall and movement of populations. And with the model that we developed for cholera, um, we have been applying it uh, in Yemen. Uh, we were very successful in doing a retrospective analysis of cholera in Yemen in, 19, in uh, uh, 2017. Um, we did a retrospective, we published the results. The British um, aid agency um, uh, leader uh, called us and said, could we work together? So in the um, in spring of 2018, we began providing them with prediction on risk uh, areas of uh, Yemen. And they placed their medical supplies, their water, safe water, chlor chlorine for water treatment, et cetera, in those parts of Yemen that we had predicted were at highest risk. As a result, in 2018, we were able to reduce cholera significantly uh, by virtue of being able to preemptively provide medical supplies and uh, treatment and, and warning. Now, we've been, um, since then, in 2019 and 2020, we've been providing every month to the British um, DFID, the uh, Foreign Aid Agency, working in collaboration with the Meteorological um, Organization in Britain, with UNICEF, and um, uh, with NASA. And we provide our projections every four weeks. We are working now to get it to every eight weeks uh, prediction. And um, this allows them for uh, being able to be prepared. We're, we're expanding. We've been asked to expand by UNICEF and uh, British Aid Agency to Africa. And interestingly, in 2019, we uh, expanded our study to Sudan. And we were able to pick up a predict our prediction was there would be cholera uh, early in uh, uh, August. Uh, a risk would be very high in August of 2019, and this proved to be the case. They found that indeed cholera was occurring. So we now have this real-time prediction for Yemen, and we decided to convert the model for predicting coronavirus. And uh, we took the data from 2019, and um, we uh, determined that the virus, by our hypothesis, can become airborne, and therefore aerosol transmission would be a major factor because the virus can attach to large water droplets. And so droplet transmission in the environment, beyond just person to person, but over large places, uh, large expanses of distance. And so um, we uh, first did our analysis on SARS, um, and that was in uh, <clears throat> the earlier outbreaks of SARS, and then the coronavirus is essentially a variant of SARS. It's, uh, um, it's a coronavirus, um, SARS-2, so to speak. We refer to it as COVID-19. So we, we applied our, our I, wish, I wish I could show the slide. Um, we applied um, the analysis to Michigan in April this year. And indeed, um, our prediction <laughs> turned out to be very effective. Our prediction compared to the um, actual cases um, fit very, very nicely. We've done a, a prediction for cholera um, for the United States in 2000. Um, well, this year, uh, COVID-19. And so we think that we have a capacity to, um, to predict the high-risk areas. 
uh, I don't have the um, June, but uh, the evidence is pretty clear that we have been able to predict early on that um, the Southwest uh, would be uh, 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 at highest risk for the COVID-19. Now, um, what I would like to emphasize is that we're working simultaneously on what I call ground truth measurement. And that is to detect the virus in wastewater. And so we're working on a contract now with the state of Maryland to provide the governor with the um, data on the presence of the virus in sewage. And we are analyzing sewage from the Prince George's County area, Frederick, uh, from Fairfax, Virginia, and from um, District of Columbia. And this, uh, because we have a very, very sensitive technique for being able to detect the virus, plus variants of the virus, uh, this allows us the opportunity to be able to predict before cases actually are diagnosed or at, enter the hospital, whether the virus is circulating in the community. In addition, and this is where it's being very helpful to the governor, is if we can determine a trend analysis that distancing, masking, and other um, methods for, for reducing the incidence of the virus, contact tracing, et cetera. If the trend in the discharge in the sewage uh, decreases, then indeed this uh, supports um, the opening to the next stage of uh, getting back to some sort of normality. So this is combining satellite data, which is environmental data uh, that is associated with the, the uh, seasonality of the disease, of the virus, and coupling it with ground truth with actual cases and measuring the virus present in the direct environment. And I think um, we will be able to, I think, be very, very precise uh, in determining risk geographically, but also uh, in a local uh, uh, community, uh, the risk of the disease and the, and the success of the um, um, addressing of the infections uh, appropriately. Now, the other point I would like to make, and again, it's too bad I can't show you this slide, but it shows the number of epi epidemics that we have had <laughs> since uh, 1347. It's about every 100 years. So there'll be a COVID-2020 and a COVID-2021 and a COVID-2022 because these epidemics, as we change our environment by um, um, reducing our tropical forests by uh, expanding uh, wild um, animal uh, bushmeat type um, food uh, searching and utilization, we are exposing ourselves to these emerging infectious diseases. And so therefore, we can anticipate with the burgeoning population moving from seven and a half billion on the planet to 10 billion, that this will be uh, exacerbated and uh, that we will really need to prepare for the next pandemic as we're trying to deal with the current. So um, that's a, a, a very um, brief overview and I regret that um, you haven't been able to see the slides, but I'd be very happy to uh, make them available to anybody who would like to uh, have a look at them. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure the question will be, Will there be a secondary peak in the fall? My answer is, if we can control this first peak and don't allow it to merge into the secondary peak, then we will perhaps increase, see an increase. But if we're prepared, we don't need to have the disaster that we have had with this current um, outbreak or pandemic that's had, that has occurred. So I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rita, for the, uh, the update. Of course, uh, we appreciate very much your uh, leadership, the academic also, 
U.S. governmental work and nonprofit science policy organization and so on and so forth. Uh, we'll see later on if uh, there are any uh, particular issues. Um, in, in terms of uh, the uh, water I issue, um, is there any development to, again, to anticipate some of the challenges uh, that you are concerned with? Well, we've, we've been studying the uh, microbiology of drinking water. And, um, very, and we, what we did was uh, collect samples of uh, mineral water, bottled water from the various stores, uh, drinking fountain water. And um, I'm happy to report that we did not find any uh, coronavirus in the water supply. Uh, nor did we pick up um, any uh, fecal indicator bacteria. So for the moment, uh, our drinking water supply seems to be uh, healthy and safe. So at least that's, for some that's of the That's great. great. Great news. Okay. Thank you very much, Rita. And we'll come back to you a little bit later on. We would have to move on to our next uh, speaker, uh, Ambassador Andrew Simone. Um, as uh, many of you uh, know, he um, served in the Hungarian uh, government. Uh, he was uh, the ambassador to uh, NATO, for example, and uh, other other positions. I, I would like to mention particularly his uh, many uh, contributions to the academic uh, community. And um, he uh, focuses on transportation, uh, economics, political science, for example, and he participated in uh, many uh, academic activities of uh, Johns Hopkins uh, University and now the Atlantic uh, Council of the, of the United States, uh, the Energy uh, Center. Um, and also uh, in terms of interdisciplinary, he participated at uh, George Washington uh, University School of uh, Engineering and Applied uh, Science. And I would like to mention uh, this very uh, important uh, book that he published uh, last year, Walking uh, Towards the Free World, uh, again uh, dealing with uh, the challenge of uh, communism in his uh, country, uh, Hungary. And uh, fortunately, uh, I think we uh, have a different uh, political strategic uh, environment. So um, again, uh, we ask him to deal uh, with the transatlantic uh, uh, issues related to the uh, energy issue. Ambassador. Thank you very much. And uh, it's, it's really a, a great pleasure to see so many friends in General Clark, Wes, what a pleasure, 21 years ago when I was the first Hungarian ambassador to NATO. Uh, I remember on the first day you said, well, welcome to the club, now we're going to war. <laughs> and I remember, and, Andra, you came in to me and you told me what the prime minister had said. He said, Hungary had been to war twice before in this century, just after starting an alliance. Yeah. And in both cases, Hungary lost and lost territory. Don't let it happen this time. Yeah, that's... And we that's, didn't. We didn't. So it's, inc it's incredible. It's incredible you remember that. But I... So, and Shireen, uh, uh, so good to see you and uh, Ambassador Simonovic. So, I just want to... Before I, I, I say a few words about uh, what we're doing in terms of, uh, in terms of energy, um, at the Atlantic Council, I'd just like to come back to something, Wes, you, you said, and, and this is really, really important. First of all, um, you know, uh, you, 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 you talked about, you know, about the perspective you grew up with. Well, I grew up with the perspective of, of maybe one day my country will be free. Maybe one day my country will be part of the free West. And that is really what was driving my generation. And true enough, we did have a perspective. 
And often I wonder, just like you wonder, what is the perspective for this generation? What is the great idea out there? What is, what is the big idea like for you and me? It was, it, for you, it was improving your democracy. For me, it was democracy, period. But, and we have to be attentive to that. So we have to be sensitive to the fact that those kids out on the street, they're not crazies. They're just maybe lost, uh, lost their way and they're trying to figure out what to do. Why I'm saying this is because this is true for, this is true for the kids out on the street, but it's true for the world as well. And I just want to say, uh, come back to one other thing that you said, it's about U.S. leadership. You know, in Europe, there is a saying, the Europeans hate American leadership, but they hate the lack of it even more. And I think that is so true. And so therefore, America cannot go a ball. America has to be there. And this is true for a lot of things. And it's definitely true for climate and energy. So let me get to the point. Uh, at the Atlantic Council, uh, we had a big project, which I worked on for two years, together with my good friend, Ambassador Dick Morningstar, uh, whom you all know. And Dick and I presented this report uh, last month, uh, together jointly with uh, some leaders from the EU and some leaders from, from the United States. And it's called European Energy Security and the Critical Role of Transatlantic Energy Cooperation. And I just want to uh, tell you that it's when we started working on this report, we had no idea there would be a COVID-19. Uh, it was nowhere in sight. This is going to be a report on how America and Europe needs to hold hands to figure out the balance between the growing energy needs of the world and climate challenges. I do believe that uh, the findings in this report are as valid now as they would have been without COVID-19. The bottom line is that climate challenges globally and the energy security challenges globally can best be met with, with the European Union and the United States holding hands and working closely together. I'd, let me just uh, make a couple of points uh, on what we think is, is really, really important. Well, first of all, we stress that there is a, a growing pressure on all of us to find this balance between energy needs and the demand by society for governments to provide for energy at all times. And on the other hand, the growing pressure by society to meet climate goals. And I do believe that, that we, we have seen some signs of stress uh, it is, on the one hand, younger generations demand quick solutions to the climate issues, which I believe is uh, an important issue. But on the other hand, look what happened in France with the gilets jaunes. You raise the price of gasoline with just a tiny little bit and they are out on the street demonstrating. We have to be smart to figure out how to do this best. I'd like to immediately jump to something that is very, very important to European energy security. This is the ability of the United States to send LNG to Europe. LNG to Europe has been the single most important security aspect of gas, of energy in Europe for the last 10 years. Can you imagine what Europe's energy security situation would look like if there was no option but to import gas from Russia, from the Middle East with some unstable uh, sources. And the only country that you can rely on not having second, a second agenda 
and use energy as a pressure would be Norway. This would be a t terrible thing to Europe. So therefore, I believe it is important that the United States keep sending LNG to Europe. But no matter what, LNG, if it stays part of the energy mix in Europe, if the, if the, uh, um, if, 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 if our, our, our societies uh, will keep using coal, oil, and gas, they will have to make efforts to clean up both upstream and downstream. I'd like to stress that the European Union, since we started our work on this report, uh, produced their European Green Deal, which is huge, which is important. Uh, I think it is, it is good that Europe is showing the way, but I do believe that we have to be reasonable and make sure that we find the energy mix that meets both uh, demands of climate and energy security. Therefore, I don't think we can, uh, uh, we can exclude uh, gas from the mix. I, don't, I think uh, in our assessment, nuclear will be part of the energy mix. I think uh, we have to work uh, hard to help Europe build its infrastructure to make sure that the continent as a whole, in particular Eastern Europe, is going to have the same security as Western Europe. I'm so pleased to see that Kirk in Croatia is coming online. I'm so pleased with initiatives like the Three Seas Initiative that is helping the Europeans uh, establish their uh, their, their, their infrastructures. I'd also finally like to say that, of course, renewables are going to be the most important part of this. In this technology cooperation between the United States and Europe will be key. I think we will have to make sure that the Europeans, as they proceed with their European Green Deal, the anticipated carbon border adjustment mechanism um, uh, um, will not be discriminating uh, and will hold all the suppliers accountable, not just the United States, but also Russia and others to make sure that as Europe cleans up its cities, as Europe cleans up its countryside, it does not just transpose uh, pollution to other parts of the world, and it does not replace its own dirty energy with dirty grids coming from other countries. So I'd like to conclude by saying I don't want to go into other issues like Nord Stream 2, Wes Clark uh, mentioned that. I'm not a fan. I think it's a mistake. I think we should have stopped that. But all in all, I want to conclude by saying there is no alternative to a very close cooperation between the United States and Europe in the energy field. Uh, I hope this will be a, this is a, consensus across the aisle in, in the U.S. Congress. I do hope that whatever comes November, this will be an absolute priority for the transatlantic uh, cooperation. Uh, finally, I'd like to say that uh, the transatlantic relationship has been through difficult times. Uh, I think the West has been through difficult times. And you know what? I am absolutely certain that we will get over this crisis. And once we're out of this crisis, we will be stronger. And we will be stronger together. Thank you.
<clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, for your uh, remarks. Uh, honestly, I triggered a lot of uh, questions, uh, also related to the transatlantic relations, particularly the role of uh, NATO and OSCE and so on. But we'll wait until uh, we have the opportunity to hear from our other uh, panelists, and then we'll come back to you. Thank you again. Uh, now I would like to uh, uh, invite uh, Ambassador Gerald Forestin. Are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you, Yoda. Oh, great. Wonderful. Thank you, Jerry, for coming. And um, I just wanted to mention uh, that uh, you um, will uh, present some uh, aspects related to the Middle East and uh, Asia and so forth. The, obviously, because of your background, the State Department, um, many of the overseas uh, postings, as I recall, uh, all the way from Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and Oman, and uh, Lebanon, etc., and North Africa, like uh, Tunisia and Yemen, I think the latest uh, post that you held, uh, obviously you can discuss many of the uh, issues uh, related to the role of oil, for example, and I'm thinking about uh, the uh, last year, the uh, attack on the Saudi uh, oil uh, plant uh, and, and so on, and other concern in the Maghreb um, and uh, soil and so on. So would you kindly uh, make some of the remarks uh, now and then I think we're going to have some case study like uh, on Iran with uh, Shireen Hunter. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks, Yona. And, and you, had, uh, uh, you had asked that I, I uh, talk about the security concerns in the larger Middle East uh, related to um, uh, the pandemic and, uh, and the implications of that. Uh, it's, a broad, uh, it's a broad subject and of course, uh, like uh, many other regions, like most other regions, uh, really the answer to the question depends on a much more granular approach. Uh, so some of the countries in the region, uh, for example, uh, Tunisia, Morocco, Jordan, Lebanon, uh, that are uh, dependent on uh, imported oil uh, and gas, uh, have in some sense uh, benefited that there's been a little bit of a cushion uh, for their economy in this global uh, economic crisis uh, as a result of the, uh, the crash of uh, oil prices. Uh, for other states in the region, of course, uh, the, uh, the issues uh, that are uh, challenging them uh, and their energy uh, sectors are, are uh, the result of outside factors. So for example, and I think uh, General Clark made reference to the fact that uh, should there be a change in administration here in Washington uh, um, at the beginning of next year, uh, that would certainly, uh, almost, or almost certainly, affect uh, where the Iranians are on their uh, uh, oil industry, uh, what's going to happen in Iraq, what's going to happen in Libya, which is a very fraught situation right now, uh, and uh, where uh, the competition, uh, particularly between Egypt and Turkey, uh, Russia, uh, and, uh, and even some of the Europeans, the French and the Italians, uh, is, uh, is making uh, predictions about what's going to happen with the Libyan industry uh, very difficult to assess. Uh, that will have broader implications, of course, for uh, global uh, uh, energy markets, uh, as well as the global economic recovery after COVID. So uh, all of these issues uh, are, are impacting. And of course, the other aspect is, again, uh, Ambassador Simoni was uh, talking about the importance of gas. Uh, there, is, uh, uh, there has been a great deal of interest and a great deal of anticipation in the Eastern Mediterranean about the possibility uh, that their ability to develop and exploit uh, the offshore uh, gas 
uh, reservoirs that they've uh, found, uh, particularly for Egypt, Israel, Lebanon, uh, would, uh, would one, be an important economic uh, uh, boost for, for them, uh, but also, of course, would be uh, potentially an important source of new uh, gas supplies for uh, for Europe. So, uh, so there is uh, th there are many different factors uh, that are out there. Some COVID related, some uh, some not that are going to uh, influence the energy sector going forward. I thought that I would uh, talk a little bit more specifically, though, uh, when you talk about Middle East and energy. Generally speaking, uh, you're talking about the GCC. Uh, particularly the Saudis, the Emiratis, Kuwait, Qatar, um, and uh, and I thought that I would uh, uh, focus a little bit more on, on those particular societies uh, and talk about how uh, this current situation, both on COVID and uh, and the global economic uh, downturn, are affecting them and are affecting uh, their energy sector going forward. And then I also thought, as uh, several other of the speakers have, uh, General Clark and Ambassador Simony, uh, the, uh, to bring in also the issue of, of uh, renewables and climate and how that might affect them going forward. So uh, like, the, uh, like the rest of the world, uh, the, uh, the Gulf has not been uh, immune. I think early on there was some uh, hope and some expectation uh, that they would be less uh, directly affected uh, by COVID than, uh, than other areas. Uh, but uh, that has not turned out to be the case. Uh, the, uh, the Saudis uh, have, uh, have accounted over 160,000 uh, COVID-19 cases uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia uh, with uh, nearly 1,500 uh, dying from the disease. Uh, this has had a, a huge impact on the society. Uh, you may have seen as a, as a kind of a side reflection of that, uh, the announcement uh, just earlier this week uh, that, uh, that they were going to limit the Hajj, uh, which is at the end of July this year, uh, that they were going to limit it to only 10,000 people uh, and, of, and uh, only people who are already currently in Saudi Arabia. That's a comparison to what has been about two and a half million uh, participants in the Hajj in previous years. So this is huge, it's unprecedented in fact. In 1919, the Saudis did not uh, stop the Hajj. Uh, so this is uh, uh, an absolutely dramatic uh, change. Uh, we've seen also in the UAE about 45,000 cases, over 300 dead. Uh, there is an expectation that Dubai uh, may be one of the most directly affected uh, urban uh, centers in the world uh, because of uh, COVID. Uh, there is an expectation that about 70% of the businesses in Dubai that, are, that were operating pre-pandemic are going to be closed by the end of this year. I also wanted to mention another aspect of the effect on, the, uh, on COVID. Uh, and that is a departure from the GCC states of uh, uh, many of the foreign uh, uh, workers uh, that their economies depended on, including their, uh, their oil industry. And so the uh, Saudis are anticipating that over a million, maybe 1.2 million expatriates are going to be departing from Saudi Arabia by the end of this year. Most of those, of course, are, are unskilled or semi-skilled laborers, uh, but it's also including an increasing number of the professional class uh, who were uh, very much a, a central element of, uh, of their economies. Uh, they were the people often who made uh, economic uh, progress possible, and uh, they are departing uh, the region, many of them probably never to come back. And that will have also secondary and tertiary effects more broadly in, in the region, including for regional security and stability, but we'll get to that. Uh, the, other, uh, the other aspect, and I, I think General Clark referenced it in his comments, uh, was in fact the, um, the effect uh, of, uh, of Mohammed bin Salman's 
a very badly timed decision uh, to basically uh, launch an oil price war uh, that was targeting the Russians primarily, but uh, one can uh, rule out the idea that, uh, that the uh, U.S. unconventional oil and gas industry was a secondary target of the, uh, of the Saudi move. Uh, it turned out to uh, be a disaster for the Saudis, uh, as well as the rest of the oil uh, exporting countries. Uh, it uh, has devastated, of course, the U.S. industry. Um, as was pointed out, uh, there has been some recovery in oil prices uh, that were under $20 a couple of months ago. Uh, both West Texas Intermediate and Brent are somewhere around $40 a barrel uh, right now. So it has come back. But uh, as I think, again, General Clark pointed out, uh, the Saudi budget is predicated on a level of about $80 officially. Uh, many uh, analysts believe that in order to balance their budget, they need over $100 a barrel. Uh, and uh, it's going to be a long time before they get to that level. If they ever get to that level again, uh, they uh, about 8.1 million barrels a day were taken offline uh, in an attempt to stabilize the, uh, the, the uh, sector and to balance uh, demand and supply. Uh, there is an expectation that uh, some of that is going to come back online, uh, but it's going to be a very slow recovery. It's not going to be uh, really before 2021 that you see uh, a significant uh, return to pre-pandemic uh, production levels. And at least in some of the areas, it's going to be 2022 uh, or later. Uh, and so uh, if, if the price is going to stay in that 40 to $50 a barrel range, uh, it's going to mean uh, that all of these economies in the Gulf are going to be running at substantial deficits uh, for the next several years at least. Uh, it's going to mean uh, that they're going to have to tighten their belts on some of their spending. Uh, it may affect even the uh, defense industries and their ability to go forward uh, with some of the, uh, uh, some of the basic uh, defense spending that they were planning on, on making and, and frankly that the U.S. Uh, was anticipating from them. Uh, but even beyond that, it's also going to have an impact on their diversification plans. All of these governments were already uh, in the, uh, in the, 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 um, the, the, the position of, of trying to diversify their economies away from dependence on oil and gas uh, but their ability to actually succeed in these diversification programs like Vision 2030 in Saudi Arabia was really contingent on having the income from the oil and gas sectors in order to finance this transition that they were hoping to make. Uh, and so the, uh, the decline in oil income is going to also affect negatively uh, their ability to do what they needed to do on the, uh, on the diversification programs, which are central to their ability also to address the demographic uh, challenges that they confront, uh, a wave of uh, young men and young women who are entering into the labor force uh, who are going to be looking for jobs uh, over the next uh, uh, four or five years. Uh, then the last point again uh, is one that has been mentioned before, and that is the impact on renewables. Uh, the fact of the matter is that, uh, that uh, you know, we've seen significant changes here in the U.S., a 40% uh, increase in the amount of, uh, of usage of renewables in our electricity grid. India, another major importer of, uh, of Gulf oil and gas, uh, has increased its reliance on renewables by 45%. Uh, in Europe, Italy, Germany, Spain, the U.K., all significantly increasing their, their use of renewables. Uh, this is going to be something that is going to be a continuing factor and is going to affect uh, the ability of the Gulf uh, states to recover from uh, the impact of the uh, COVID uh, pandemic and global uh, economic crisis. Uh, even though, uh, you know, interestingly, both the Saudis and the Emiratis and others have been leaders in their own efforts to increase their use of renewable energy in their own economies, their own societies. 
uh, but uh, still is going to affect uh, their, uh, their income and their economic stability. Uh, I wanted to also to, to uh, I mentioned before the secondary and tertiary effects of the departure of uh, the expatriate labor from the, the Gulf. Uh, that is uh, absolutely going to affect the ability of Gulf economies to recover. Uh, it's going to put a great deal of pressure on them to uh, come up with a labor force that can take on these jobs that are being uh, left open by the departure of expatriates. But of course, it's also going to affect uh, the source countries. So countries like Egypt, Pakistan, uh, India, Bangladesh, East Asia, uh, as well as North Africa, Tunisia, Morocco, uh, are going to have a severe impact by, because of the decline of the remittances that they were dependent on for their own economic stability, as well as the return of a large population of people who are also going to be looking for uh, entering into the labor force in those societies. And then the other aspect of that, uh, and I'll, I'll uh, close on this, the other aspect of that is that the ability of societies like Saudi Arabia, the UAE, uh, Qatar, Kuwait, uh, to continue to provide large uh, um, uh, levels of uh, foreign assistance, foreign aid to uh, these challenged societies, whether you're talking about Jordan, uh, the Horn of Africa, Sudan, uh, uh, North Africa, uh, elsewhere, are going to be restricted over these coming years. And again, uh, this is potentially a source of uh, both economic and political fragility in these societies. Uh, that is something that the United States is going to need to watch very carefully uh, because again, in terms of issues like uh, counterterrorism, uh, security, stability, the growth of extremism in the region, uh, these are all issues that can very well feed into a, a growing security problem for the United States and the West. So let me stop there. Uh, thank you very much, Ari, for your uh, overview, of course. Uh, we can deal with some other issues later on with the Q&A. I would like to move on in the interest of time to invite Professor Shireen Nunter. Are you there? I am here. Can you hear me? Yeah, wonderful. Thank you very much, Shireen. Uh, welcome again to uh, our program. And um, again, in the interest uh, of time, I, I would like to, to mention uh, specifically uh, your many... Uh, no, you don't have to, to go on. Okay, well, I, I just wanted to, because uh, we are looking at your uh, very distinguished uh, academic uh, work uh, in uh, Washington, Georgetown, and uh, George Mason, and so forth, um, and um, also your your work uh, in other universities uh, at Harvard, for example, and in Brussels, and so on, um, and CSIS. But um, again, since uh, this is the uh, ambassadors uh, forum, I, I wanted to mention, if I may. Uh, also, your work going all the way back right. to the times, I guess, of the Shah right. when you were a diplomat right. and you were a member of the Iranian uh, Foreign Service and you served uh, in London and, of course, Geneva. Uh, I remember uh, also you work at the Iran uh, UN mission uh, in Geneva and so forth. At any rate, uh, uh, please, um, you can cover many of the issues, but particularly, I thought uh, you might educate us uh, in regard to the Iranian and perhaps some other issues in uh, Asia. Well, uh, thank you very much, Yona. It's again a pleasure uh, to be in one of your events. Uh, you always uh, know or what uh, issues are important and you always uh, organize meetings like this. This time it has to be virtual. And uh, I have been uh, very privileged that to have cooperated with you. I don't want to say we have always cooperated almost now, approaching almost 40 years. So uh, it's, uh, 
Uh, I remember once at somewhere at one of the New York universities that that was the first time you invited me in on some of those uh, uh, terrorism program. And of course, it's very uh, good to uh, be together with all the distinguished speakers and panelists. Um, I would like to uh, a little bit um, explain, if I might, uh, what has been the impact of uh, the corona uh, crisis uh, um, on Iran, uh, both in terms of its uh, domestic politics, in terms of its economic strategy, uh, and also in terms of uh, uh, foreign policy. Um, but um, first of all, before going into the impact of Corona, uh, a very important thing to remember that Iran has been now, uh, at least since May of 2018, being subjected uh, to the harshest uh, sanctions that any country has ever uh, had to endure, I would say almost throughout uh, history. Uh, Iran's situation is really actually uh, looks more like a uh, embargo, of complete embargo. And of course, uh, the most uh, significant uh, factor is that uh, Iran cannot have any uh, really normal banking operations. I mean, literally. And uh, under the circumstances, I think that a lot of countries uh, have also had predatory uh, attitude towards Iran. For example, the Iraqis have not been paying Iran for uh, the large amount of uh, natural gas and electricity that Iran has been sending to Iraq, which actually in many ways has helped the US interests in Iraq uh, because has kept Iraq completely from um, going back again to the uh, uh, all-out uh, uh, civil war. Uh, South Korea, these are some of the Iran's oil sale, which was not at the time subject to sanctions, uh, but they are keeping close to five, six, seven billion of Iran's money uh, just using for themselves. So I think that it's uh, the situation that Iran has um, face is really something that very few countries have faced or are facing. I'm not going to go into whether this is right or not right and is it effective or it's not effective. That's beside the point. But what I'm trying to say is that already even before uh, COVID-19 had hit, um, Iran's oil uh, income had been reduced to almost nothing. And at the moment, the um, According to some of the figures, I have not made a specific study of this particular thing um, because I didn't know that we wanted to focus too much on energy, but nevertheless, I follow events. And uh, so Iran's oil income, the last time was that uh, it had uh, from $27 billion had uh, come down to $2.7 billion. And so it, uh, you can imagine that how this situation is affecting Iran. And even in terms of Iran's nine oil uh, exports, um, not all of the foreign currency that they um, gain has um, is being transferred to the country, whether again because of the sanctions and the uh, difficulties of uh, uh, banking operations or because some of the Iranians themselves uh, of the um, exporters not giving. I read, for instance, that uh, of $27 billion of non-oil experts, uh, close to $7 billion had not been uh, returned to the Treasury. So obviously, Iran is facing a tremendous economic uh, pressure, uh, has been facing for a long time, but it has really been uh, becoming um, um, uh, suffocating since the American withdrawal of the JCPOA in 2018 and the reimposition of periodically new and new and new sanctions. Sometimes I think that uh, U.S. is running out of things to sanction. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, like you sanction some um, sailors, what effect it's going to have? It's really symbolic. Uh, but I suppose the alternative will be just to go to war. Uh, and I don't think the U.S. at the moment can neither afford it financially nor that the people will stand for it. So they have to, and they're not willing to, you know, negotiate Americans also uh, because the terms they really present to Iran is, you know, accept this or else. Uh, 
And so we are having a situation of, as somebody said, maximum pressure in front of the maximum resistance. So, uh, but unless this deadlock is broken, the Iran situation is going to be bad. Now, it's in these conditions, under these conditions, that we see the COVID-19 hits Iran. And I think that uh, in, in some ways, the intensity of the uh, Iran's uh, COVID crisis uh, had a political, I think, uh, um, uh, underlying factor. And that was that uh, uh, Iran it really is now counting on China. And I think that with some of the things that are happening, if indeed they are all uh, um, uh, um, uh, implemented, it will make Iran uh, a colony of China. I, I actually wrote something about a year ago uh, because the Chinese have uh, and the government has now approved it, a 25-year agreement with Iran uh, that they will have almost extraordinary advantages in uh, explore, exploring all of Iran's uh, natural resources, from oil to, uh, uh, to uh, um, mines and what, what have you, and that the Chinese investment firms and so on, they will have, even when Iran is out of sanctions, if it ever comes out of sanctions, uh, that they are going to have, uh, you know, a privileged position. I remember in my article, I said that this uh, agreement is worse than the famous Reuters agreement of the 19th century that basically gave everything to British, the Baron Julius Reuters. Uh, so I think that um, the reason I think that the Iranians did what they did, in fact, that uh, uh, they continued flights to uh, China, including Wuhan, uh, because of their politics. Politics, they didn't want to go on China's uh, wrong side. And of course, this really, um, then the, the, the virus came with great uh, virulence uh, in Iran. Of course, there were a lot of people that said this, and it had some political, you know, ramifications. But uh, like uh, everything else in Iran, it uh, sort of uh, uh, quieted down. Uh, the latest the statistic that uh, I heard of the number of people who have caught the virus in Iran has been about 212,000, which is pretty high. And the number of death is about 10,000. I think that relatively speaking, uh, given the limits that they are under, for example, the US uh, sanctions even prevent Iran from getting uh, medicine. Uh, the Trump administration said that humanitarian trade is not part of it, but it is because you, if you cannot have a, a banking operations, you can't get anything. Uh, the Swiss tried through some particular channel to get a little bit of, uh, you know, drugs and so on uh, to Iran, but it is like a drop in a sea. So uh, that's why that the number of, you know, um, um, fatalities are, are also rising. However, I think that relatively speaking, and if you compare, for example, even with the performance of um, Spain or Italy, or even to some extent uh, uh, France, I think that the Iranians did not do so badly given the conditions that they are uh, under. Um, now, and I think that one of the things that has happened because of all these sanctions and now the COVID and, of course, the um, uh, oil crisis, which even the little that Iran can export, it doesn't really um, get anywhere. I think the Iran Iranian strategy has been essentially uh, to move away from oil economy. This is something that Iran has wanted to do. The Shah was particularly, I mean, the Shah used to say that Iran should not export crude oil. Actually, I think I agree with them that we should export petrochemicals instead of crude oil. Uh, I think that one of the things that Iran is now doing is really focusing uh, on uh, domestic uh, production, domestic production of as much as possible that they can uh, in an effort of almost a strategy of uh, uh, import substitution uh, as much as possible. 
and uh, I think that um, uh, this is this is the way at the moment uh, they are moving and they are uh, thinking. They are trying to uh, to reduce the um, the dependence of the economy on oil income. Um, I think that theoretically, of course, if they can, uh, uh, if they can indeed uh, overcome the inefficiencies that exist, and if they can overcome the political squabbling and so on, and if they can use resources more uh, wisely in the right direction, I think that uh, they can at least have, uh, let's say, in a two to three year period, assuming they survive until then, uh, that uh, they can have a, at least a, a non-oil export of close to 50, 55 billion dollars, which would be just about enough uh, for them to um, keep running the country and also do some development things. On energy, I think that uh, Iran, of course, is lucky because uh, they don't have to import energy. They have tremendous amount of uh, natural gas, and so that they can even go move towards uh, clean energy. Um, and they are increasingly using gas in uh, industries and uh, um, all these other things. And there are massive uh, uh, transfer of gas pipelines throughout the country. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, they, they, they are doing that. And now that they are prevented from exporting gas uh, to Europe, for example, and even Turkey is playing power politics uh, with Iran because they don't like what they are doing in uh, Syria because Turkey wants, Erdogan wants to have the, uh, the, a new Ottoman Empire, a new guy's Ottoman Empire, hence presence in Qatar, presence in Syria, presence in um, uh, Libya. This is all part and parcel of Erdogan's uh, you know, vision. Um, and so when, they, for example, they are trying to reduce the gas export, uh, imports from Iran, and so uh, lately there was a gas pipeline that was um, exploded or something, probably KKK or somebody, and the Turks have refused to repair it. And uh, so I think that, uh, you know, Iranians are getting the message there. Increasingly, they're getting the message that they have to rely only on themselves, even if it is for a subsistence, uh, for a subsistence economy. But as I say, they have at least one advantage, and that is that they don't have to pay exorbitant uh, prices for the import of, uh, you know, energy. Looking through the future, what they are also doing in terms of oil exports, and this also obviously has a geopolitical dimensions, um, Iran is also like the others, like the Emirates and Saudis and so on, who in the last several years have been trying to bypass the Straits of Hormuz in the Persian Gulf. Um, they are uh, uh, trying to also um, limit the export of oil from their terminals uh, in the uh, closer to the uh, Strait of Hormuz. I, I just read that the construction of the gas, uh, uh, no, absolutely a pipeline to carry oil uh, through the uh, terminals in the um, Jask um, port in the uh, uh, Sea of Oman is already has uh, started. Anyway, I think that this is part of it. As far as the uh, uh, renewables is concerned, uh, I think that uh, uh, they are to, trying to do it. Only, um, I think it's all a question of money. In Iran, everything now is only a question of money because there is sufficient know-how in the country. There is sufficient know-how in the country. Uh, there are some companies that they call them knowledge-based companies, which are not doing so bad. They are uh, small companies that are not doing so bad, including, you know, in pharma, uh, pharmacology and so on. Um, so technology is more or less there. Uh, it's just the money, money for investment that they don't have and uh, uh, that they cannot, you know, transact. Um, but there, in Iran, there is a tremendous potential for, of course, solar energy. I mean, in parts of Iran, you have almost 365 days sun, 
And now increasingly they're also getting wind, which is not a very good thing because this is part of the climate change dynamics that it's affecting Iran. Uh, it's kind of a feast or famine syndrome. You either get, they either get floods or get, you know, long uh, stretches of uh, drought. But nevertheless, they are thinking along those lines, particularly in certain parts of the country that um, uh, is really remote, they can have small, you know, let's say solar uh, panels and so on for, for uh, villages or local things. So I think that they are in that sense also moving towards that. They are aware of the um, climate uh, problems and climate issues, but they have so much, uh, so much other problems that that is not uh, uh, affecting it. The, Political impact of the um, COVID-19, uh, together with all the others, and you know, sanctions and so on, in particular, um, in Iran actually has been the. Uh, again, you know, people like me has been saying this for at least 40 years now, almost. Well, not quite, but almost. Um, but that the more pressure in general does not lead to democratization. It often leads to actually, um, you know, hardening opposition. I mean, a lot of people think that Soviet Union fell because uh, Star Wars, but I do believe that the taunt and other things, the dialogues and so on, uh, cracked open, I think, the Soviet system that some of the other, you know, ideas, more liberal ideas managed to get through. So I'm not suggesting that pressure is not has no place in diplomacy. Of course, I would sound stupid if I said that, but I think that it requires a more um, uh, a judicious mix of pressure and incentives and so on. And our policy has been, and also the you know Pompeo's attitude. You know, basically, you have to do these things, and then we will see. It's not that okay. Then you know we left this or whatever, but so anyway. So the, as I say, Iran is now uh, in a survival mode. Uh, you know, they have to do whatever it is that they can uh, to survive on their own in a very uh, difficult uh, conditions. But I think that what has the COVID has done to other countries. Uh, coupled with, uh, I think that some of the mistakes that they themselves made, I mean, I think that, um, you know, MBS really did not have any uh, viable security reason to attack Yemen, you know, full scale attack on Yemen. And now he is caught in there and doesn't know how to get out of it. It's, it's very, very similar. We have a saying in Persian, it says that uh, it, this, the, um, the stone that a crazy man drops in a well, a thousand wise men cannot bring it up. So I think that that is what bin Salman has has it has gotten into uh, in a hole, and now of course the oil money has gone, um, and the, so I think that it seems to me in general with the oil money go, going down with the. Uh, um, Yemen uh, quagmire and the Khashoggi uh, killings and so on, the mystique of Saudi Arabia, I think, has really disappeared. Not that it, they did have any big mystique, but it has also shows the limits of pa uh, money as an instrument of uh, policy and, and power. It takes a lot more than cash just to make a great power. I mean, it's, it's, these are also some of the things that uh, are, are coming. And so, I think that um, my own uh, feeling is that uh, the COVID as such hasn't changed really basically what Iran was already trying to do, uh, which means that, again, I'm not saying they are right. I'm just explaining what they are thinking and where they are going. Um, they have reached this conclusion, particularly the more hardline, is that we have to, uh, we have to, uh, um, stay the course, and that the honest would be on America. If you want regime change, you know, you have to come and get us. Uh, we are not just going to, because of economic sanctions or COVID, uh, you know, just crumble uh, uh, from inside and so on. So in other words, regime change on the cheap is not going to be possible. You want us, you have to come and get us. And I think in some ways, the Emiratis and so on, um, 
you mentioned you're not the, the uh, Aramco thing. I'm not going to get into that whether Iran was behind it or Houthis where Iran gave him the order and so on. I mean, the powers to be know what they are. They have more uh, means of finding out the real thing. But I would think that certainly, you know, uh, there must have been some sort of green light from Iran that, yes, go ahead and do that. Because the Iran wanted to send a message, again, in light of what I said. You can't have regime change on the cheap. You can't prevent our ships from going through the Persian Gulf and at the same time to have the Saudis do whatever they want uh, anywhere. Uh, and so that was a message. So you want to come and uh, uh, are you, um, you know, really spoiling for a war? Okay, come on, we're ready. We uh, get you. So, um, but what happened, it seems to me, it scared the, the uh, other Persian Gulf states, he said. Emiratis, after that, sent messengers to Tehran and trying to come uh, some sort of, uh, at least, uh, um, reduce the confrontational thing. And I think after that, to some degree, Emiratis' tone against Iran has. Uh, uh, has been uh, uh, somewhat softened. Of course, they have a new, uh, a new whipping boy, which is Turkey, uh, so which diverts attention from Iran a little bit. Um, so I think that, um, and then you know, when the COVID uh, uh, started coming uh, to Iran, in fact, uh, Emirates were one of the people who sent some aid to Iran. They were Kuwait and Emirates, Oman, even though they don't have much and then uh, um, and then uh, uh, what was the Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, and these countries sent some aid to to Iran. So I think that uh, you know the COVID thing on Iran Persian Gulf relations has been you know sort of mixed. I think that perhaps to some extent uh, uh, to some extent uh, uh, um, positive. Um, positive. Economic downturn in Iran, and I will just say this and another small point and um, uh, finish. Economic downturn in Iran has also negatively affected, I think, particularly Afghanistan. And it has also increased tensions between the two countries. I mean, Iran has been spending billions and billions of dollars on Afghans. I mean, the, the children in the uh, refugee so-called, they get free education. The number of Hazaras now, I hear from Afghans that uh, have now gotten PhDs and so on, are going back to Afghanistan and working there and so on is, is just unbelievable. And some of the Afghans, Pashtuns don't like that because Pashtuns wants to dominate. And so Hazaras used to be not very educated. So when educated Hazaras come, they are not going to accept the Pashtun overlordship. So I think that this has really affected Afghanistan. The tensions got very high, but finally the Afghan foreign minister or the responsible for foreign affairs went to Tehran and I think they have a patched up thing. It's also affecting, uh, I suppose, Pakistan to some extent, not as much as. So I think that this whole policy uh, on Iran has been affecting everything. I have one final word or actually two final words which is not exactly related to Iran. I know I am an ethnic expert, so I'm not really allowed to comment on the broader issues, but I nevertheless would like to make, if I might, a couple of broader comments. In my mind, to be honest with you, and I have said this long before the latest lower oil prices, I think that actually lower oil prices, you know, I hope they will continue for some time. Um, at least because this is a very, very, in my opinion, salutary thing for the oil producers of the Persian Gulf, especially countries like Emirates and so on, because what they have used their oil money on. They have used it on airplanes that they cannot use because they don't have uh, pilots to fly them. They have used their money to hire mercenaries from Latin America to go and destroy Yemen. They have been using their money to go and fight in Libya. Uh, and so I think it would be a useful thing if 
they didn't have this much money to throw around. Um, there will be enough money to investment if they stop using the money in those other things. And I think that the other good thing might be that they might begin to focus a little bit on democratic reform. I don't mean democracy with a capital D, but even a small thing that you have to be some responsiveness to the uh, people. Um, and so that, that really might be a, a, a a positive thing to happen. On the other thing that I also think, looking through the post-corona world, I think we have to realize that the world has been changing. I know the power of nostalgia, and I am myself very nostalgic for an awful lot of things, but nostalgia is really not a good uh, advisor for, uh, you know, for, for planning for the future. The fact is that the world has been moving towards a greater, dis, uh, how shall I say, dispersion of power, economic and other power in various areas. And that means that no single power can dominate the world, whether through soft power or through hard power. I don't think China is going to be able to the new superpower telling everybody what to do. I don't think the U.S. can have the position that it did at the beginning of the the collapse of the Soviet Union. Part of it is also local actors also have more power. Look at what Turkey is doing. What Turkey is doing in Libya is at cross purposes, at least with some members of NATO. Macron and Erdogan are at loggerheads over this. So uh, I think when we think about future uh, ways of doing politics or managing international affairs, uh, we have to have this in mind that the world is changing. And I think the COVID might have contributed to our awareness of these changes becoming somewhat sharper. Um, and so, you know, as part of how we try to cope with new challenges to energy or to health and pandemics and find new strategies. Uh, we also have to start thinking about new ways of managing international relations. So I hope you forgive my this last outburst and uh, I thank you for listening to me. Sure, Shireen, for this uh, overview, obviously we'll get back not only to, to Iran, but uh, to some other countries uh, in uh, Asia later on. I want to move on to our colleague, uh, Ambassador Charlie Ray. Uh, as many of you know, he served many years in foreign service, uh, particularly uh, in Asia, in China, in Thailand, Cambodia, and so on. And then, of course, uh, in uh, Africa. And uh, he was uh, also um, in the U.S. Uh, military for some 20, 20 years. And uh, we appreciate very much his support of our program, academic program, on the ambassadors and the role of diplomacy in world affairs. Charlie, are uh, you thanks, there? Tommy. Thank you. Uh, and I'd like to particularly commend our distinguished panelists for an outstanding uh, group of presentations on a very important subject, uh, energy. Uh, it's, it was, I think, outlined very clearly as key to restarting both our social and economic life on the, on the planet. So, you know, this is a topic that's both timely and appropriate. I, I was sitting in my garage this morning prepping for this and trying to think, what will I say? And unfortunately, uh, General Clark and others uh, said everything that came into my mind. So, so I, I find myself at, at the risk of uh, repeating uh, what's already been said and said very effectively, but, but I would like to underscore a couple of things. I, I think it's been said, as we come out of this current pandemic, uh, we need to be smart about it, and particularly with, with energy as with everything else, uh, we shouldn't be looking at trying to restore the status quo ante, but, but of making things better. Uh, things like having more reliable sources of energy, not being overly dependent on foreign suppliers, on, on having 
uh, renewable, uh, more reliance on renewable energy. I mean, these are all great points. I would add to that, uh, while we are looking at rebuilding or restarting, whatever term you want to use, of our own energy infrastructure, our own energy sources and needs, we shouldn't ignore the poorer countries in the world uh, who also have energy requirements. And, and we need to put a little bit of effort into figuring out how we can share the wealth with them to, to, to meet the energy needs of their own people. Uh, the other thing, though, that was mentioned by a couple of people, and I think really bears uh, reemphasizing, and that is the need for the U.S. to acknowledge uh, its need for engagement with the world and, and U.S. leadership. Uh, it's important not just for U.S. national security, but I think for global security. And in order to do that, what we're going to have to do here at home is to revitalize our flagging diplomatic capacity. Uh, and as uh, was just said by the previous speaker, uh, learn new ways to, to interact with the world in the changed world that's going to exist when we come out of this pandemic. I, I think this has been, uh, of the four symposiums that you've had, I think this one has got to be probably the most profound and, and the most important of them all. And it's been a, it's a, it's a real honor to be a part of it. Thank you. Charlie, for your continued support of our academic work. I would like to move on to Ambassador Simonovic. Uh, as many of you know, he uh, is the ambassador of uh, Croatia, and Croatia is uh, still holding the presidency of the Council of the European uh, Union. And um, uh, Ambassador Simonovic uh, contributed to our work uh, before also to our uh, publications. And uh, we would like to invite him. Ambassador, are you there? Uh, uh, professor, uh, dear Jonah, everybody, uh, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And indeed, uh, we, it was, it was, we, uh, we were honored uh, for having uh, General Clark uh, being our um, keynote uh, speaker today. Uh, a a well-known uh, uh, political analyst, Francis Fukuyama, in his latest um, uh, article in the uh, uh, foreign, foreign, foreign Affairs uh, uh, in, uh, entitled the, the Pandemic and Political Order, he, says, uh, he begins by saying, major crises have major consequences, usually unforeseen. And this is very indeed applicable most directly to the issue we are dealing with, to the issue of, of the uh, actual pandemic. And the, uh, which is having a, 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 a full range of consequences uh, seen and yet to be seen, uh, um, uh, foreseen, unforeseen, foreseeable, unforeseeable, uh, political, economic, financial, security, societal, cultural, and also when it comes to the to the energy sector. And the I, I would I would say uh, briefly that the, uh, what is happening with the energy sector and the relationship of the, in terms of the consequences of the pandemic on the energy sector, we have seen actually a reinforcing of uh, some pre-existing pre trends, uh, trends towards re renewable green, so uh, green sources, uh, which have uh, prior to the, uh, to the pandemic uh, been made uh, more viable technologically and economically more efficient and affordable. So we are we're talking about wind, uh, wind energy, solar, but also electric drive. And at the same time, what happened with the pandemic? It's actually a, a slump created by the, by the pandemic in the uh, fossil uh, fuel sector. Uh, plus, plus uh, uh, General Clark was uh, describing uh, some aspects of it when he was saying, we, we are facing an extreme volatility of that sector. Uh, uh, coupled with the, uh, the, with the resiliency of clean energy, uh, actually reinforces the trend of, of, uh, of a shift towards green energy uh, away from the, from, the, from the brown energy. In terms of the decisions taken by the states and also by the, by the investors, which is, I guess, equally important. 
uh, this, these are bad news for some uh, companies, indeed for some oil fossil uh, companies, as well as some, for, uh, some countries, which is in some aspects uh, 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 not that bad at all. It uh, decreases the leverage of some countries, such as Russia, for example, and Iran. On the other hand, it's bad for the uh, full range of uh, developing countries, oil producers, which uh, with the oil prices going down, which uh, with the uh, oil and gas not, not being needed anymore that much, they may find, they are finding themselves in, a, in, a, in, a, in some dire straits. They would need uh, 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 an enlightened help by the international community in order to make a switch and to, to bridge that gap. And also, also, we have seen a trend in consumption that using the example of the US, in less than 10 weeks, the US has uh, increased uh, the uh, uh, consumption of uh, uh, energy from renewable sources by an estimated 40%. So there has been a visible shift away from fossil fuels towards uh, the, the, uh, the renewables. Uh, this is, this is in, in, in a larger strategic uh, uh, conceptual perspective, I would say that it has been consistent with a sense of uh, clear and present danger of climate disaster uh, of global proportions uh, provoked by our uh, carbon, carbon footprint. Uh, and that, that, this sense has been made uh, much more acute by the pandemic. Uh, which uh, in, 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 its, in, it, in its quality of being another previously um, uh, recognized but neglected threat. So uh, having neglected that particular threat, do we really need uh, 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 an escalation which is already on, on, an ongoing escalation of another recognized threat? And this is extreme weather threat, climate change, global warming, you name it the way you like it. Uh, when, the, when, we, when we are looking into the, uh, the, uh, the landscape of the energy sector within the context of the ongoing uh, pandemic, uh, we see, it, we see the, this trend uh, 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 also happening before the pandemic. And again, uh, these trends have been uh, 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 made, more, uh, made more present and more acute by the, by the pandemic. Why before the pandemic? The states have been taking a lot of measures to move away from the brown energy towards the green energy with the, uh, the, uh, the global level with the Paris uh, Climate Accord. Uh, the the European, European Green Deal has been mentioned and the, uh, the European Union has certainly uh, already for some time uh, become a global normative power, meaning that what gets decided at the level of the EU becomes very much the global norm. Uh, it, it filters down to the, to the entire, to the entire world. And I guess this, this shift is, is, uh, is a very good case in point. The EU is uh, uh, aiming to become climate neutral by uh, uh, 20, 2050. And it is, it is earmarking uh, 1 trillion euros of investments for green projects in, in the coming in the coming decade. So we're talking about serious money, we're talking about serious, serious, serious process. And this is not limiting to the EU. I would uh, maybe the uh, the EU the when when it comes to the US as uh, when you look at the, the federal administration, that may not necessarily be the be the case. But when you when you break it down to the uh, to, to the federal states, then you see that the, then you see almost the same trend. You look at the uh, uh, how the uh, the approach taken by California, for example, but not exclusively. And secondly, we have already been seeing the trend uh, in looking at the major investors uh, uh, making a shift towards uh, really a, a, a strong shift, strong and visible shift taken, taken purposefully. Uh, you may call it uh, uh, something which is uh, smart when it comes to the, to the uh, increasing the profit margin. And when it comes also uh, 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 on, on something being very uh, socially responsible, uh, uh, many, many, many big in investors actually wish to be perceived as being the, uh, at the forefront of doing something which is not only profitable, but also good. That, that is the, 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 the main topic of the uh, social responsibility. And we see, for example, the, uh, 
the, uh, the, world, the world's largest asset uh, manager, the US company BlackRock, actually trying to decouple uh, uh, its growth from its uh, 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 impact uh, on the, in, 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 in the inver in, in environment with the investment in renewables, uh, basically moving, moving away, from, uh, divesting from uh, fossil fuel companies. So the, on, a, on an immediate horizon, uh, what we can expect uh, looking into the post-COVID-19 economic recovery. Uh, there is a strong push towards creating sustainable economies, uh, fueled by the uh, renewable energy, uh, again, uh, stimulated very uh, strongly uh, by, uh, by our shared responsibility to prevent uh, uh, extreme weather, climate change, uh, by our carbon emissions, uh, sh by shifting towards green energy in order to avoid uh, other uh, uh, preventable and the recognizable global disasters. This is not uh, that this will be the uh, ultimate trend. It's not a given. It's, it depends upon uh, the, uh, the joint actions of, of many actors, uh, the states, international organizations, as well as the uh, investors and private companies. But what, is, what, is, uh, what we, uh, 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 I would say, justifiably may identify at this stage, this is what may be happening. And let me let me finish by, by with a quote from the the, the economist uh, on this issue, saying that the COVID pause is not inherently climate friendly. We have seen the reduced uh, emissions. We have seen the reduced uh, manufacturing and industrial activity. This is not, of course, good per se. It's an economic disaster, but it had some uh, a positive uh, uh, environmental uh, 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 consequences. So the COVID pause is not inherently climate friendly. Countries must make it so. So the, the certainly the uh, when it comes to the uh, priorities during our presidency, we have been strongly advocating the uh, the, um, the uh, this shift from brown energy towards green energy, uh, promoting the European Green Deal, and the uh, with the, with a bit of a good luck uh, that that may be become a global trend. And the uh, stimulated again uh, by the by the by the resiliency and the viability demonstrated by the green technologies in the first place, and also and also by an understanding that we are responsible to uh, do um, everything in our power in order to avoid uh, 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 another uh, global disaster along the lines of the uh, of the present pandemic stemming from, uh, from, uh, from uh, a known but uh, a neglected issue. And uh, I guess the climate, the climate change, uh, extreme weather and the and, uh, environmental damage is, the, uh, is the, uh, uh, exactly the same thing. So thank, thank you very much. So move on because of the interest of time. So Dr. Anthony Feinberg, um, who has also distinguished background in government, um, high positions uh, in Homeland Security, DOD, and the Federal Aviation Administration, uh, working also uh, in Congress and the Office of Technology Assessment, and academically, of course, uh, he uh, worked in a number of universities for a long time and contributed a great deal to uh, literature. Tony, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Thanks very much. And I know we're at the end and overrunning a little bit, so I'll be very quick. Uh, I had, uh, first of all, the similar experience of Ambassador Ray in deciding what I was going to say uh, about energy and finding that General Clark had said it all and said it better. Uh, then I thought, well, I would talk about uh, about uh, some other matters, and, uh, and I, I found that Ambassador Simonovich covered an, a number of things regarding climate change that I was going to say. So let me just 
say a few things very quickly and, and get done. Uh, first of all, on, on the question of uh, COVID and bio threats, my impression from when I worked some years ago in the Department of Homeland Security was that there was a lot of focus on uh, human uh, generated uh, bio threats. And or, whereas there was concern about epidemics and pandemics, when I was there at least, there was much less. This was a mistake and perhaps had been had been fixed a little bit under the Obama administration and then forgotten entirely now. So uh, planning is really good. The past may or may not be prologue, but one has to pay attention to the past. Uh, in the uh, early uh, 21st century, we had two indicators, SARS and MERS, of pandemics that did not uh, extend beyond a thousand fatalities in either case, but were perhaps warners and for, uh, uh, forerunners of what might come afterwards. We should in retrospect, have paid more attention. Um, regarding fossil fuels, I just wanted to make one uh, little point, and, and that is that the, the collapse, at least temporary, if not permanent, of the, fo of the fossil fuel or the, or the oil market uh, will certainly uh, result, coming at a rather critical time, in an increased interest in renewables, among other things. Uh, and uh, as, as uh, Ambassador Simonovich said, uh, one result of this, which would actually be quite favorable in the long run, is that those countries who happen to have a lot of oil will see their imperialist leverage decrease as people go more to other sources, which uh, incidentally uh, have a much better influence on the climate that we live in. But the main thing I want to talk about uh, is going to be somewhat politically incorrect, but since I'm not an, uh, a diplomat and never have been, I've been kind of a scientist most of my life. Um, I want to talk a little bit about governance and particularly governance in the United States regarding what's happened with COVID. Uh, one indication of uh, incompetence and quite frankly stupidity uh, occurred in TSA, an organization, the, the Transportation Security Administration, where I worked briefly uh, nearly 20 years ago until I escaped, or maybe 15 years ago. Uh, and that uh, has result, well, first of all, they, as you may know, had a storage, a, a stored capacity of very many uh, N95 masks, which people in the front lines, the security officials, the officers, the people you see every day in airports, wanted to use, and the central administration for weeks did not permit them to do so. Right now, among, there, there have been 50,000, roughly speaking, officers in TSA. Over 700 have so far tested positive, five are dead, and one contractor who also performed the same work in a few airports, TSA doesn't work, contractors do, uh, one contractor is dead. This is just a, 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 almost a microcosm of what's happened in the United States because of lack of leadership and lack of governance. Uh, the uh, Republic of Korea, South Korea, uh, and the United States discovered their first COVID cases, uh, I, I'm told, in the same day, somewhere around the end of January. Uh, Korea took certain measures. We took certain measures or refused for a long time to take certain measures. Uh, yesterday, we had uh, something like 38,000 new cases of COVID in the United States. And in South Korea, they had 51. Not 51,000, not 5,100, but 51. There's a reason for that. And it's not only that this is Asia and uh, societies have different, uh, have different norms and it's easier to mobilize the population. But compared with Germany, Germany had a, had, a, had a total number of 9,000 deaths from COVID, and the United States has now 125,000. The question of, uh, of governance is vital to fighting threats like pandemics, but not only like pandemics. You have to have a leadership, and you have to have somebody who doesn't say, well, the states are going to take over because nobody co is able to coordinate the states effectively enough. Some of all this may possibly be due due to just the wave, natural wave of an epidemic. It started in Europe more than here. Europe now has a very small number of, of, small number, it's still serious, but a small number of cases per day, less than 100 by and large, maybe a little bit more. We have 38,000, maybe we're, late, we're a bit later in the, uh, in the process, we started later, but it looks very, very bad to me. I think that this country, uh, the United States being one of the leaders in the world, perhaps it used to be the leader, it is not anymore, uh, should be able to uh, protect itself considerably better than it has. And rather than uh, 
saying we're going to go it alone and falling uh, down a deep hole. We have to, and I agree on this very strongly with some of the other speakers, we have to reinvigorate our alliances and work closely and collaboratively with our alliances, not only uh, in strategic matters, not only in military matters, but also in international matters regarding, in this case, global health. Thank you very much, uh, Tony. Uh, I think we're running uh, a little bit late. I, I would uh, like to ask Professor Don Wallace um, whether we can conclude uh, this. Uh, John, Jonah, Jonah uh, if, are, are you there? This is Andrea speaking. Can, can I just steal one minute from, from all of you? Because I, I want to be very, very clear about something that I probably was misunderstood, and it, what prompts me is, is uh, Ambassador Simunovic's uh, great comment about the future of, of, of uh, renewables. My worry is that we, we, we do have some illusions about, uh, you know, uh, the, we, we have learned a lesson from the pandemic and we will not go back to the old. Well, first of all, once the economy start, you, you know, jump back to, where they were, and they will, then the energy needs will surge really fast. And my worry is that I don't think, I don't think renewables alone uh, will do the trick. I think what the trick is to, to make sure that we, we make an effort to phase out, uh, phase out uh, the, the, the uh, uh, coal first oil, I think gas, even the European Union has made very clear that gas will be an important part of the energy mix long term. If we can curb the methane emissions of, uh, of, uh, of, of natural gas, I think it will be a major, major improvement and the fastest improvement of, uh, of, uh, in, in order to meet our climate goals. So I, all I want to say, nuclear has to be part of the equation if we want to meet our climate goals. All I want to say is that I think the idea is incredibly important and it's good that the European Union is taking the lead. By the way, I do believe that there is more going on in the United States than people want to realize. But at the end of the day, I think it is really important that, as I mentioned in my introduction, that we do keep the balance between the, the, the energy needs, not just in our own countries, not just in the United States and Europe, uh, and Europe, but also in Africa and other places, and the social pressure from, uh, from, from the, particularly the, the young generation to meet our climate goals. And I think that's extremely important to keep in mind that I will stop here and I'm sorry for the intrusion. That's fine. Um, uh, obviously we, we can, uh work on these uh, issues for a very long time, but I, I have to ask um, Don Wallace, are you there? I am. Listen, Yemona, first, as always, I want to thank you. And as Charlie said, this has been a, a very impressive panel because I want to thank everyone on the panel. Uh, I'd like to make an argument for the long view. And what I mean by that is this, there was life before this pandemic and there'll be life after this pandemic. Uh, and indeed, the same will be true when there are future pandemics. And what I'm trying to get at is that the, it, I think there are underlying issues which are much more profound than pandemics. You know, when I studied history, we never mentioned the Spanish flu, although my grandfather died from it. It just wasn't seen as part of history uh, in, in the large. And I would say the following. Yes, I think this panel is made very clear the, the tension between a sustainable future and the, need, and the energy needs is profound. And that will, it was before the COVID and it'll be after the COVID. And my guess is it won't be that different after than it was before, quite frankly. The same with social justice. Uh, the human desire for justice, I'm a lawyer, a law professor, is probably even more profound than for freedom, although two are related. And I think the demands for justice before this pandemic and which of course have grown in the United States in particular because of what happened in Minneapolis, uh, they will continue afterwards. So I think it's a mistake in a way to have our vision and our conviction clouded by an excessive attention on these pandemics as crucially important as they are. 
Uh, but I, and I think this has all been brought out by all of you. And once again, we have to thank Yona. I, as I listen, I've known Yona for a very long time. He was my client for two decades. I threw him out. He's an impossible client. Um, I've been his friend for 40 years, and that's much more possible. Uh, so we really have to thank Yona, who cultivates all of us, who continues to be de dedicated and devoted to what he calls inter interdisciplinary academic studies. And Yona, long may you live, and long may this series of panels continue, these programs. So thank you very much, Yona, and thank all of you. Thank you.